Um, is, that, is that all right with you, John? <laughs> I'm unmuted now. <laughs> yeah, that's fine, Christina. Yeah. Okay, so, okay, so should I launch into it? You launch it and I'll follow. Okay, great. Okay, so just start a little bit. Are you hearing an echo? You're hearing an echo? Hearing an echo? Yes. A little bit, yeah. Uh, then this is not going to work. Sorry, you're going to have to put up with the music, I'm afraid. <laughs> if you want to, I, it's just going to take me a moment to get back onto my computer. This is one of the downsides of Zoom. <laughs> No, actually, it's the dad's side in the street that loves to have the catchy and upside, loves to have neighborhood concerts. <laughs> this will only take me a moment. I'm very sorry. Recording in progress. Okay, I don't know how much you can hear of the background, but it's not unpleasant in any case. So I'd like to start with just a little bit of an overview of the Satipatthana. So we have a sense of the, the territory that we're working in. And I think one of the things to, to understand about the Satipatthana is that it really is describing a universal human story. I mean, each of us, of course, has our own personal story to be respected, to be understood. And yet there's also a very universal story that we share. And I think in having that person, in being able to hold both of these together, it offers a doorway in to, to understanding the nature of this human story. So the four Satipatthanas begins with establishing mindfulness in the body, as we have been exploring today and as you will have been exploring in your training. And this is a section of this discourse that is the largest. It somehow acknowledges the importance uh, that the Buddha put upon being an embodied human being, being a human being who actually lives within this body fully. In fact, at one place, the Buddha says, when there's no mindfulness of the body, there is really no mindfulness at all. That's a huge statement. It's a really huge statement and well worth looking at in our own experience. But I'm sure in our own journeys and in the, the ways that your experience of teaching people, we really have a sense of, of just how difficult and how challenging it can be to inhabit this body fully for so many different reasons. You know, if, if for people who have lived, who have had a trauma background, you know, the body is never felt to be a safe place to be. If you're living with chronic illness or pain, the body doesn't feel like an inviting place to be. Um, we have uh, in our cultures, you know, such powerful body images you know, of what the right body looks like, you know, and how the body should be. 
and the impact that has upon many people in how they see themselves, how they judge themselves. We also, of course, live with this very powerful habit of primarily occupying the landscape of our thoughts, our, our mental chatter, our obsessions, our ruminations, our imaginings, often forgetting the body entirely. We have such a curious relationship with the body, don't we? We can be so deeply identified with the body as being who I am. And what happens in the body is happening to me. And yet we can also have a very dissociative relationship to the body. You know, really making this huge separation between mind and body. So, of course, the discourse begins with establishing mindfulness in the body and knowing the body as the body. Knowing the body as the body. Again, this is such a powerful instruction of step beginning to, to find a way out of this identification with body that causes so much suffering, but also not to move into a place of abandonment, of dissociation from the body, of knowing the body as the body. Then the discourse, on the, uh, the discourse begins to unfold, but the practice never leaves the body behind. We move into the field that we will actually probably speak much more about tomorrow, this field of Vedana, the V-E-D-A-N-A, -A, the feeling tone of all experience, the pleasant, the unpleasant, that which is neither pleasant nor unpleasant, built into every sensory impression built into every psychological movement. Again, the, the, the guidance is the same as with the body, to know Vedana as Vedana, to know feeling tone as feeling tone, beginning to understand the possibility of stepping out of the seemingly hardwired hard -wired reactivity to the pleasant and to the unpleasant. The teaching unfolds to know mind states as states of mind, to know moods as moods, really beginning to see how much our, we see the world through the lens of our states of mind. The world is colored by our states of mind. We can feel to be such a prisoner of our moods and our states of mind to know moods as moods, to know mind states as mind states. In this teaching, there's the encouragement towards this deep sense of knowing, not just an intellectual knowing, but a really felt sense of knowing this is how it is. This is as it is. So rather than encouraging a kind of you know, detachment, there's actually an encouragement towards a kind of what I think is being a sort of wise intimacy, a wise intimacy. And then the teaching expands to, to begin to, to see psychological processes. What is it that really distorts our capacity for clarity, brightness, flourishing? And what is it that really supports that capacity for clarity and flourishing? So this is the basic landscape of what we are exploring. And of course, at the center of all of this is this word sati. It's usually translated as mindfulness. And I think this is where I'll turn over to John for a bit. Okay, yes, yeah, so I'll pick up where Christina started on this. I mean, the first word that's probably perplexing is this word satipatthana. You've heard the word sati, translated as mindfulness. I'll say some more about that. Patana just means to found or establish something. So it's a process. The problem with a lot of these texts, particularly taken in a religious context, is they're often seen as being almost doctrinal things that are to be believed in. Really what the Satipatthana Sutta is, is actually two things. The first is a training manual 
and the second as a training manual. It's a training in a series of investigations. Yeah, a series of investigations. It's not that mindfulness, in a sense, is something we fully understand until we're actually involved in the investigation of all of these things that Christina has talked about. Yeah, investigation of our body and our relationship with our body. Investigation with the coming and going, you know, every day is coming and going with pain and pleasure, pain and pleasure, dislike and like, you know, and things which in a sense don't fall into either category easily. And that's happening all the time. I mean, the Buddha actually speaks about this as being the taste of our experience. All of our experience comes with a particular taste. And this moodedness, you know, I won't go into it because Christina's covered this very well. You know, this is coloring our experience. This is our, our world, our lens through which we see things is the mood of this moment. You know, if we were perhaps together, I'd say stop and examine and see what your mood of this moment is. You know, just see what's around because actually when you come to check in perhaps a little bit later, it will have shifted and your world has become slightly different. It's become coloured in a different way. It's like swapping my glasses for lenses which are tinted with pink and swapping them for lenses which are tinted with blue. You know, and I believe in both. You know, the world is pink or the world is blue. And then we get these processes. You know, so we investigate these through this notion of sati. And the notion of sati becomes clearer in the notion of this investigation, in this way of investigating. Now, the word sati is a very interesting word. It's a verb in the original language. It comes from the verb sarati, which means to remember something. Yeah. So a big aspect of this is remembrance. So what is it we're remembering? Well, I'll come to that in a minute. Mindfulness, well, <laughs> I'm a kind of, I feel we're stuck with this word, uh, which is not, not a very good translation of the, of the Pali Sati, uh, which can't really be translated with any one word. You know, but I, I, I kind of fight, feel I'm fighting a losing battle if I want to change that one. Um, so mindfulness, this is something you know, that we all know about it. You're all in training to become mindfulness instructors or you know, have taken courses in mindfulness. Yet the word actually means to remember, or perhaps the most literal translation is to bear in mind something, you know, to actually bring it to mind. And it doesn't work on its own. It works in relationship to other factors of mind, which are really important here. So it's not just sitting down and suddenly we're in a phrase of mindfulness. We, we are establishing a lot of different intentions which go along, which support the functioning of what we're calling mindfulness. Another way of translating this, um, you know, I mess around a lot with translating things and trying to think them through in translation, is, is Recollection. Now, recollection works very well in English. It doesn't work so well in other languages, but recollection works very well because it means to gather, you know, to take the mind from scatteredness and to gather it. And I'm sure Christina will probably talk about sheep at some point and gathering the sheep and herding sheep. Yeah. And I feel that's a bit what we're doing. We're gathering our sheep off the hillside and bringing them in. Um, into some kind of collectedness, some state of, of wholeness, which doesn't exist in our fragmented reactive patterns of life as we normally live it. Yeah. So recollection is a good, and it's recollection or remembrance of something in the present moment. Now, I won't go into the history, but the word actually derives, the word sati derives from a whole history of Indian thought, which actually means remembering past events, historical events. And what's so clever about this particular usage and the way it's used in this, in the Satipatthana Sutta in particular, is this emphasis on not remembering the past, but remembering the present, yeah? Uh, which is a strange usage, isn't it, of the word remember? But I think we can all see very clearly what he's trying to get at by this, that we're remembering that which often gets overlooked or forgotten, which is what we're actually doing in this present moment. Because temporally, 
in terms of you know, our relationship with time, we're usually strung out between past events and future events. You're either thinking about the past or thinking about the future, mostly about the future in our planning, our decision making, our whole way of looking forward to that actually, which might never arrive. So what is being made clear is that we try to gather ourselves in the present moment and everything that arises is arising in relationship to other events, other events in the body, other events in feeling, other events in mind, and of course, to events going on outside of our body, mind and everything. Yeah. So all of John, you've actually frozen. This very rarely happens. I don't quite understand it. Erica, can you send him a message in chat or Josephine? Yeah, I'll do that now. This very rarely happens with John. Okay, he's not on freezing, so perhaps it might be useful if I would pick up again and continue and then we'll circle back to John. If he somehow, it's a very distinguished freeze, I must say, but it is a freeze. I think one of the best ways of understanding sati is through the, the similes and that I used. And I think very often in, in the way that mindfulness is used in, in the West, it's often seen to be quite a sort of one dimensional uh, quality. Um, whereas in the early teachings, it's, it's a multi-dimensional quality. There are very active aspects to Sati, there are very receptive aspects to Sati. John, you're back. I started picking up, but I'm going to turn back over to you. You have to unmute. I'll be muted again. <laughs> I don't know how much got lost in that. Do you remember where you where it was cut off? I don't know what happened. Um. You were talking about bearing in mind. Okay, well, obviously the most basic sense of sati is to bear in mind something, to remember something. And I think I probably mentioned this. Did, you know, does that make sense? We, what we're remembering is our present moment. We're not remembering simply past events. Most of our relationship with the world is in terms of past and future. You look like, everybody, can everybody, anybody hear me? <laughs> yes, we can hear you, John, yeah. Oh, good, yeah, because it's, um, everybody's frozen. I don't know whether it's my line or, or what's happening here, but in terms of the way that we relate to our world, it's usually through past events and future events. And what Sati is really indicating is coming back to the present moment, gathering that mind into the present moment and bearing in mind that everything that happens to us is relational. So nothing arises that isn't occurring in some relationship to something else in our experience. And so the remembrance is to remember that so when we're having a particular strong emotion in the mind, a particular strong feeling in the body, that this is happening in relationship to other things. And this is one of the fundamental aspects of what it means to understand sati. And I'll say some more, but I'm going to pass over to Christina at this point. Christina? Yes, I'm here. Good, I can't see you. <laughs> oh, I'm very much here. 
So what I started to say before John came back in is I think that mindful, this word mindfulness is often used in a rather, I would even call it somewhat simplistic way in sort of common jargon as a way of observing or watching or seeing or sometimes even interchangeably used with attention. Whereas in the early teachings, this is a multi-dimensional term. Some aspects of mindfulness are very engaged, um, involve some agency. There are aspects of mindfulness that are very receptive and spacious. There are aspects of mindfulness that are very focused, very directed attention. There are aspects of mindfulness that are really concerned with a, a qualitative relationship with everything that is going on, really concerned with, with kindness, with care. And I think the best way of really understanding this is through some of the similes, the images that I used in the early teachings. And you, you might ask, why is it important to know these different nuances of sati? Because different, set, different sets of conditions, different moods, different circumstances call for at times very different responses, very different ways of being with them. We might be in situations in, in our lives inwardly where a very spacious, receptive mindfulness is really asked for. We may be in a situation internally where investigation is really asked for. Um, so it is really important to know how do we draw upon sati. It's not that the qualities are separate or hierarchical or linear, but what are we foregrounding in the sati landscape to be most effective, most helpful, most skillful in any moment. Now, it's often described as there being kind of like four, four basic um, uh, four basic dimensions of this word sati. And I'll, I'll just talk about them for a moment and maybe John will feed into this before going into some of the nuances. Now, the first of these is often uh, kind of translated as a kind of simple knowing, a simple knowing. How to see the present moment fully without adding anything, without taking anything away, without the coloring of a mind state. The simple knowing, the body as the body, the breathing as the breathing, a thought as a thought. Now there, there are different, this is one of the, it's a really such a significant skill to develop inwardly because we often know how much we proliferate around what we see, hear, feel, touch, sense, how often it's not simple knowing, how often we're launched into a complex narratives. This is beginning to step underneath those narratives and to simply know. Some things happen in that. One of the things that happens is that we step out of the eye of the storm. We establish a relationship through that simple knowing with what is being experienced. We've stepped out of the contractedness of identification into this knowing of the body as the body, a thought as a thought. Stepping out of that contractedness of investigation, of course, of identification is what allows investigation, it allows understanding, it allows kindness, it allows care. None of this happens in the midst of contracted identification. So this is one aspect of simple knowing. The other aspect of simple knowing is, as John has already described, the sense of collectedness, gatheredness, being able to direct mindfulness, being able to direct intention, being able to direct and sustain intention and attention. And the second really important uh, domain of sati, and you will hear this in some of the images we use, is protective awareness. Not defensive awareness, but protective awareness. Developing the skill and the care 
to protect the well-being of our hearts from the surges of impulses and psychological habits that can so easily overwhelm. It's about learning how to be a wise gate gatekeeper. The third of these primary domains is really concerned with investigative awareness. This is not just thinking about things, it's also experiential investigation. It's going beneath the concepts, going beneath the stories about what is happening to investigate the actuality of experience on a moment to moment level as changing, as being incapable of providing lasting satisfaction, as being non-self, not me, not who, not what defines me. And the fourth of these domains is really, really about reframing perception. You know, what we perceive, we think about, we proliferate about so many of our perceptions are not just navigational perceptions. So many of our perceptions are the ways that we carry the past into the present. The ways that we see through how we have seen before. We feel through the lens of how we have felt before. We react repetitively because we are perceiving repetitively. So it's about reframing perception. Now you'll see that um, you'll see how these actually are uh, really expressed through some of the similes and the images that we'll go on to explore. Maybe John, maybe you would like to add something to this piece. Okay. Yes, I'd like to add something to this. I think it's uh, the first thing to make clear is, of course, that often mindfulness gets associated with that simple awareness, that simple perceptive state that um, Christina is talking about you know, as being the first basic aspect. Well, it's not basic in the sense that it isn't built on. And the other forms of mindfulness, which Christina has talked about so far, the investigative and the protective and the cognitive reframing that we can engage in are built on simple awareness. Nothing can occur without simple awareness. Let's make that clear. Without becoming aware, if you like, tracking the topography of your own mind and body, beginning to see what is occurring, being vigilant and attentive to what is actually happening, nothing else can happen. You know, mindfulness will not basically affect change or very little change um, just with simple awareness. Yet, unfortunately, I think there's a perception um, that that is what really mindfulness is. It's just becoming aware and becoming aware and looking at and seeing and knowing to a certain extent what's going on, that the change is going to happen through that. The Satipatthana text and many other texts as well make it very clear that change isn't going to occur in that way. It's not going to occur through simple awareness. Some things will change. There is no doubt about that. But some of the bigger issues that we have, some of the bigger, I don't know, pools that we might find in, in this topography of our mind and body, some of the dark pools, uh, are not going to be changed by that. For that, it needs something else. And the something else is actually sometimes we need to protect our minds and sometimes we need to investigate where things are arising from. What is nice about these four broad categories, which obviously includes this um, cognitive reframing as well, is that it breaks down this idea of mindfulness being a homogenous entity. You know, we can speak about it almost as being one thing. You know, it's an activity. Um, remember I said it is actually in the original language is derived from a verb form. It's, it's something that we do. It's not a state. It's something that's happening and it's happening in relationship to other things which are happening. So first of all, we start off with that simple awareness. We have to understand um, what is arising? What are the, you know, what are the things that constantly arise in your mind and body? What's going on? You know, that's that investigative question that I, you know, sort of couched this morning, which is what's actually going on here? We need to know that. 
we need to know what arises repetitively, often through sedimented aspects of mind and body. You know, there'd be, you know, these are what we can call conditionings, but they're almost like sedimentations, you know, strata which have been laid down and from which we react. Um, and I'll say some more about that probably as we go through these few days. So we need to get to know that because no real change is going to occur unless we understand that's what what's going on. So a lot of what you will be familiar with and a lot of what we do is actually doing that, checking out, you know, almost palpating, you know, touching what is actually going on for ourselves in the mind and body. Yeah, and we can do this obviously in our experienced world as well, not just in our meditative world, but in our experienced world. If we just step back and try to gather, you know, the senses in a particular way and the mind in a particular way that we begin to have some kind of familiarity with what is arising there. So I'm really stressing the vital importance, but not the exclusivity of the simple awareness because the other things become important. Now, just to finish off, Christina talked about similes. Now the simile um, that's used for simple awareness is somebody who's standing on a high tower over a forest, looking out over the landscape. Yeah. So it's seeing what's actually going on in the landscape as far as you can see. Yeah, obviously, that seeing is limited to a degree, and I think we all have to accept that, that mindfulness is not a cure-all. Something comes out across the horizon and perhaps only becomes into view later on. Yeah, But this image, the simile that's used, is of a watcher looking over the landscape. And that is vitally important, but it's not the end of the story. It's the beginning of the story. Christina. Uh, John, it's best if you mute at this point, otherwise we echo. Okay. Um, one aspect of this standing on the watchtower and having this kind of panoramic view as much as possible of the world is that it is also non-preferential. It, it, it's non-preferential. It, it's not based on what we like or what we don't like, what we favor, what we reject. This is a non-preferential seeing. And as John says, this is truly the beginning. Now, another of the similes that is used that I find quite poignant is of a person being caught in a thicket of brambles or thorns. And I'm pretty sure that we've all had some experience of this in our life, what happens when you get caught in a thicket of brambles and thorns. Your first reaction is to try and pull yourself out. And it is the absolute worst thing to do. Hmm? You get more and more entangled. So the simile is concerned with a person carefully extricating themselves from this thicket of bramble and thorns, knowing how to you know, take the thorns out of the clothing, out of the skin. And it, it really refers to the, um, this, this attitude of care, this attitude of, patience, this attitude of vigilance, um, yet yeah, carefulness, real carefulness in untangling ourselves and extricating ourselves. Knowing the power to easily become more and more entangled. Now, another of the images or similes that is used, it's used in a couple of different ways. And this really feeds into this protective awareness piece of sati, is of a gatekeeper standing guard at the gates of a city and warmly welcoming into the city the visitors who really mean to serve the city and its inhabitants well and politely, courteously turning away the visitors who somehow threatened to undermine the well-being of the city. For me, this is one of the most, one of the most crucial nuances of mindfulness of sati, um, because it is drawing into the conversation this quality of discernment, 
you know, I think we get into kind of sticky territory when mindfulness is so frequently presented as a non-judgmental awareness. You know, that often how that gets translated in people's experience is that, you know, it, it, it almost equates judgment with discernment, which in some ways it can be. Discernment is critical in this process of waking up, knowing what serves us well and knowing what doesn't serve us well. Knowing what supports flourishing, knowing what undermines flourishing, knowing what to welcome and actually what to kindly say no to. The gatekeeper stands at the gates of our hearts and minds. And it is really cultivating that sense of discernment. I think without discernment, mindfulness is in danger of, of passivity. It's in danger of passivity. You know, just say yes to everything. Just say welcome everything. Quite frankly, I'm not prepared to welcome everything. You know, if I see habit patterns arising that I understand well, you know, they're deeply rooted, they are harmful, they undermine well-being, uh, I'm, I'm not in a, a position of wanting to welcome them. I will learn the skills through drawing on different aspects of mindfulness to actually say, no, this is not, not now, not here not this. It's, it's like I refuse to volunteer for suffering. Isn't it? And that's what discernment offers to us, that we can stop volunteering for suffering. So it's really knowing what to cultivate and actually what to relinquish. Discernment is the bridge, the gatekeeper and the discernment of the gatekeeper is the bridge between sati and skillful response. It's really knowing what to cultivate, what to relinquish. Hmm? So it's the bridge between that awareness and then the responding to what is held within that awareness. I'll just, I'll, I'll talk about one more and then I'll hand it over to John. The, the third one I would speak about is, is, you know, ties into this, this sense of investigative mindfulness. And the image that is used in the early teachings is the image of a surgeon, that someone presents themselves to a surgeon with an arrow, in, the head of an arrow embedded in their body. And the surgeon doesn't just dive in and try and yank this arrow head out, but the surgeon carefully examines the nature of the wound in order to make a diagnosis, in order to have a prognosis, and in order to prescribe a course of treatment. So this is really this investigative awareness, which is, as John used the word, palpating. Palpating experience to really understand what is happening, um, to understand what is needed, to understand the possibility, <coughs> indeed, of bringing distress to an end and of really knowing the means to do that. Maybe John, you'd like to pick up there. Yep, I think there's something very important in what Christine has just said, and I want to echo it and reiterate it. And the important thing is to be said is that, of course, although I stressed the importance of simple awareness, simple awareness can be seen to a degree as a passivity. Just searching out the landscape, looking at the landscape, being able to recognize what's going on as it comes to you, because it will keep on giving itself to you in experience. Yeah? Um, welcome things and unwelcome things will present themselves to you and will give themselves to you. And it's getting to know that. Yeah? So far, that's what I covered earlier on. But, of course, and I think this is the really important aspect of this, it's knowing that which we want to, in a sense, move out of our lives, that which isn't skillful, that which isn't wholesome, that which doesn't lead to you know, this sense of flourishing in our lives, but leads to actually to pain and distress and suffering. And knowing what to cultivate and this is a really important word this word cultivate because actually the word that gets translated as meditation 
actually means to cultivate. You know, I won't go into it too much um, because it's not a course in linguistics. But normally we translate this word as meditation. You know? And it's speaking almost a different language from the language of these texts because the texts talk about cultivating. And what we're cultivating is one of these supports in this sense of protection as well. We're, you know, Christina and I have both talked about discernment, but actually it's clearly knowing what is useful, what is wholesome and to be cultivated, and that which is not to be cultivated in our lives. That's that sense of judgment. To lead an ethical life need, needs identifying and knowing that which leads to a flourishing for ourselves and the others around us because it's relational and a sense of dropping or letting be of that or those behaviors and those thought patterns which lead to unwholesome and unskillful behaviors in our life. Without this sense of well, protection is a good word to a certain degree of protecting, but also in protecting our minds, we're protecting it from that which we can sometimes just slip into as our automatic thing, you know, the automatic things that we cultivate in our lives. And often these are unwholesome patterns. Why do we do that? Because they're familiar. You know, that's what we know. You know, often our reactions to life are to rely on the trusted things. Often those are unskillful patterns and we continue to cultivate them. What we're doing is identifying, knowing, actually um, deciding that which we want to be at the center of our lives and our minds. Yeah? This is really absolutely vitally important. And so in protecting our mind and bodies yeah, is not to accept anybody in, you know, not to accept all comers. Yeah? It's the, then to be able to take that, that sort of map making that we've done of the mind and body of the simple awareness and now take it in and say, actually, I don't want to be there. I don't want to be in that dark pool of despair. I want to be somewhere else. Yeah? I want to be on, I don't know, the, the bright hill out of the shadows, out of the, you know, the shadow of distress. And so we actually protect ourselves from that dark pool of going there. Yeah. And this is to turn what is normally thing or thought of as being passive into something much more active. And so that instruction that sometimes is still given is to just sit with something well, it's knowing what to sit with and cultivate, not just sitting with anything. That might be fine for the map making process, but it's not fine if we want to cultivate a different way of life. I'll pass it back to Christina now. Yeah, just a, a couple of more images that I'd like to share. There are many, by the way, um, before we just look at some of the functions of mindfulness. One of the images is of a, a wooden stake hammered into the ground and attached to the wooden stake are six wild animals on leads. And the wild animals are, are desperately seeking to, to escape and to run into the familiar habits of foraging, etc. And the stake is keeping them firmly anchored. Um, as they begin to calm, as, as they begin to settle. And the stake in the ground, of course, is the stake of sati, of mindfulness. And the six, the six wild animals are representing the six sense doors, the five traditional sense doors of sight, hearing, smell, taste, that. And the sixth sense door in Buddhist psychology, of course, is the mind. And we really see that habit Habit finds a way of repeating itself. In fact, habit wants to repeat itself. It wants to travel in familiar territories. It actually wants to disconnect, to dissociate from the present moment. Sometimes it is felt to be too painful to be in. So mindfulness is, is, 
is grounding. It's grounding, it's calming, it's teaching our sense doors new ways of being in this world that are not governed by habit. And the last of the images that I really feel it's important to draw upon is the image of a mother protecting the life and the well-being of her only child. And this is the image of, of kindness, of befriending, of care, this very qualitative aspect of sati, that there is nothing dry, nothing cold about sati. It is actually a way of caring for, a way of caring. And in the, the discourse on the teaching of metta, the Buddha describes metta as a sati and uses the same refrains as in the Satipatthana, whether standing, sitting, walking, or lying down, to cultivate this way of being that is the most noble way of being in this world. It is very important to actually remember how much uh, metta is actually um, in, intrinsic, actually essential to the cultivation of sati. Again, as an ingredient of change and transformation, as an ingredient of do undoing, actually, or no longer providing ground for some of our most deeply rooted habits. And I mentioned this in my group this afternoon, that certainly one of the most powerful changes that I see people make in this practice and on this path is a shift out of the territory of aversion into the landscape of befriending and kindness. And it is one of the most powerful shifts, most transformative, not only inwardly, but in our ways of, of interfacing with the world around us. Okay, I'm, I'm going to leave the images there, the similes there. John may want to bring one more in. Um, I want to leave a little bit of time just to look at the functions of, of sati. John, maybe you'd like to. Okay, yeah, I just want to pick up on actually the images you've already used because I think these are very powerful images. The image of the gatekeeper, you know, the city walls with the gatekeeper at the, you know, the six city walls, at the, at the six city gates embedded into the walls, protecting those gates, letting in that which is good and wholesome and friendly and keeping out that which is an enemy. That requires discernment. Uh, I'm really emphasizing what I said earlier on, but I think it's very, very important to do that. But we don't do this out of hatred. We don't do this out of aversion. And you know, joining what Christina was just saying, you know, just before I started speaking um, to this image is the idea, actually the gatekeeper is caring here. The gatekeeper cares about those he lets in. He also cares about that which he excludes as well. Um, you know, no matter what presents itself, he's still, if you like, nice or pleasant to those that present themselves. Yeah, so it's not a violent aversion to this. And we see this, I think, in that ability that we have to turn towards what is arising, yeah. what's arising in our experience. It may be a friend, but it may be something which is destructive. It may be a trauma, maybe something from our past. Maybe a repetitive pattern that we see arising. And to turn towards it, because it's compulsive, it pulls us in, to turn towards and acknowledge that you're there. Yeah. Although we're saying, in the sense, the gatekeeper is saying, not now, you can't come in now. He's not saying never. Yeah. So, for example, when a painful experience arises, it's not necessarily that I don't want to see you or, or deal with you or, you know, um, see you forever. It's saying, I don't want to see you now. This is not the time. This is too painful. It's too tender. And so that just that moment that we begin to turn towards something out of, and I'm going to use the words that you know, you'll be familiar with, which are often spoken about interest and curiosity. Yeah. 
it's interesting we use the word curiosity because as I was saying to the group this afternoon, that the word curiosity, when you trace it back from its old French roots in English to its Latin, comes from the word cura, which means to care. Yeah. So actually showing curiosity about what's pulled my mind in this particular direction, away from the breath or whatever object we have, we can be curious about. Yeah. I think the, the discernment is there in the gatekeeper. He's looking or she is looking and discerning whether this person is to be let in or not. Yeah. Is this person going to wreak havoc in the city or are they going to be friends and help it to flourish in this way? And equally, we can do this um, in a sense by developing the sense of discernment and protection as well, because I think discernment and protection go together. They're not two separate factors but it's also coupled with caring. And I would say, unless there is that element of caring and kindness, it actually isn't mindfulness. It's a cold, if you like, rather bleak stare at what's going on. Yeah. It's not actually mindfulness. And just finally, you know, when we talk about investigation, the investigative mode, which is in this third factor, you know, this third aspect that we can group together some of the mindfulness practice in. The surgeon, and he's trying to extract what is really painful and damaging, the arrowhead, he uses a probe. Yeah, and they still do this now, you know, for example, you know, and for, you know, luckily we don't have too much of it here, but for gunshot wounds to see, you know, the dimensions, you insert a probe just to see the dimensions of the actual um, of the actual bullet, or in this case, the arrowhead, you insert it and you find out the dimensions, how deeply it's buried, how big it is, you know, how to remove it as best as possible. Yeah, that probe in the Pali text is called sati. It's called mindfulness. Yeah, that's what we're probing experience with. We can't just, uh, if you like, our most painful aspects of experience. We can't just let them go. You know, the wound isn't going to heal itself. The wound requires proactive investigation, often investigation into the ways that you live your life. And so it has this investigative dimension of mindfulness where we begin to see that the ways that we live rather than just live our compulsions and our reactivities. Yeah. OK, I'll pass you back to Christina again. Thank you, John. So um, we're quite quickly running out of time here, as we generally do. So I just want to just uh, just close with just briefly, just briefly, just uh, looking at some of the functions of mindfulness. I mean, I think, you know, we actually know that in many people, not in all situations and not for all people, but that mindfulness can be a powerful agent in the transformative process. And, you know, we need, I think it's really important to understand how mindfulness works, why it works, you know, how does it bring about change? And to begin to sense this in our own experience. You know, clearly reframing cognition and views is very crucial in bringing about change, in taking ourselves out of the hold of the past and into the present. I mean, one of the functions of mindfulness is really to begin to, to sever the link between feeling tone and underlying patterns of reactivity, that the pleasant can be held just as it is without the aversion, the anxiety, the fear, the judgment. Um, the pleasant can be seen and held as it is without triggering the underlying patterns of, of greed and wanting and craving. This is a powerful step. This is often what takes us out, really out of the field of many of our most deeply embedded habit patterns. Mindfulness cleans up the field of perception. In many ways, it also cuts the link between perception and emotional history, association, and memory. That I can see something which has been quite difficult in my life without it triggering 
all of the, the, the waterfall of narrative of pain. I can see something anew. I can see something anew. I can relate to something anew. It's beginning to cut that link between perception and how we have perceived before. Another of the, the effects or functions of mindfulness, which I think I have been reflecting on a great deal and in many ways I think it's, it's under, and unnot often goes unnoticed, is the way that mindfulness is actually really beginning to correct negative attentional bias. You know, you begin to, you know, this is hinted at in the eight week programs when you, you have the pleasant event calendars. But I think a, a part of the mindfulness journey is teaching us arts of appreciation, of joyfulness, of beginning to see what is well, as much if not more, that we see that which is broken. I think mindfulness is actually offering us um, pathways of, of confidence and, and trust in ourselves and in the process. And I think this begins to, to rebalance this negative attentional bias, which we can a spiral that we can so easily get caught in of seeing what is broken, needing to fix what is broken, dwelling upon what is broken, proliferating about what is broken, fearing what is broken, beginning to correct that. And I think this is one of the most powerful tools of mindfulness, developing this, this often undernourished capacities we have for appreciation, for gratitude, for celebration, for joyfulness, for that, 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 that power of sensitivity. This changes how we see life and ourselves. We will probably go into this more as the days go by, but I think that's where I would like to end this evening, John. I just want to mention a couple of things that I'll pick up because I can kind of end on a slightly I hope a humorous note here is sometimes we think that mindfulness just is just going to occur it's going to just occur we we get on our walking path or we sit down on our cushion and it's just going to happen yeah have you ever been deluded into that thinking it's just going to happen all I've got to do is just sit there and mindfulness is going to come upon me well, actually, this is not the way the texts speak. And I want to pick this up, perhaps, as we go through these few days, which is actually, first of all, we need attention. We need the cultivation of attention for this to happen. We need also a degree, and this is an interesting word, of ardency, passion about what we're doing. It just doesn't happen without that. You know, I think I'll go and do my practice. You know, that sort of grudging um, aspect. Uh, that's not what it's really about. It's really having a passion for what we're doing, a passion for the investigation. It also requires, as the gatekeeper, a vigilance, uh, which in Pali is called Appamada, which is actually a vigilance to actually look at what's going on and to see and to actually come to discernment as the final state. And so all of these are aspects of mindfulness and support the process of mindfulness. You know, attention and passion, I think, are absolutely vital in this process. And perhaps as we go through, we'll speak some more about this. OK, well, that's it. I'm finished. <laughs> OK, let, let's end with just a couple of minutes sitting together. Mm-hmm. <clears throat>